Brilliant. So this session is called Where Does the Power Lie? It's hosted by the Alternative UK. As we face the triple crisis of environment, social division and loss of well-being, where can we access the power to transform our future? This session is hosted by Indra Adnan, who is a psychosocial therapist, author of The Politics of Waking Up and co-initiator with Pat Kane of The Alternative UK. So that Alternative UK is a political platform that has asked the question, if politics is broken, what's the alternative for four years now? The Alternative UK produces a daily blog, works with new system builders and develops Cosmo Local Citizen Action Networks on the ground. Um, and alongside Indra, there's a fantastic group of um, speakers, contributors here who will be, all be uh, speaking on behalf of their own organisations and hopefully inspire really exciting discussions. Over to you, Indra. Thanks so much for coming along today and doing this. Thank you, Dan. And hi, everybody. It's uh, an incredible privilege to, to be hosting this uh, session. It's a two hour session, so we're going to be together for quite uh, a long time. And uh, I'd like to start by just quickly introducing our panel today. Um, and we're just gonna ask them to give a quick wave because we're gonna hurtle through this session together with you, with you really as the point. So as Dan explained, I'm Indra Adnan, I'm co-initiator of the Alternative UK. And I'm gonna introduce Alana Bloom from Enroll Yourself, uh, Anaira Ruzmaklu from Trust the People, Peter McFadgen from Flatpak Democracy, and Pat Kane, who's my co-initiator of the Alternative UK. So that's our panel, but let's start with you. Um, we'd like to really, we'd like to start this session with a quick breakout room, a very brief breakout room, where you ask yourselves the question, where does the power lie? So at this moment, before we go into this discussion, where do you think the power to change our current circumstances, to change the direction of our future, where do you think the power lies? Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you had some good chats there. And um, we don't have time for a full spectrum feedback now, but what I'd like to invite you to do is to put uh, some of your thoughts into the chat box and begin to share you know, your collective wisdom around where you feel the power lies today. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is give you a, a little um, introduction to the Alternative UK and uh, why it was that we came into being. Um, and I'm going to share my screen, but as I'm doing that, feel free to keep dropping some of your ideas and thoughts, especially if you had some first unusual thoughts about where power lies or also, you know, if you're feeling angry or frustrated about where power lies, feel free to drop those in. And I'm going to share the screen now quickly and just introduce uh, why it was that we started the Alternative UK. So we came together as a platform. Uh, in fact, it was initiated on the very day that Joe Cox was murdered. Um, we were thinking at that time that uh, politics was broken, but this was the trigger really for the extent to which politics had become such a divisive tool um, and, and lacking really the enablement and the sharing of power that people might be looking for. So we started this platform with that simple question, if politics is broken, what's the alternative? And when we looked at the reality now, we saw what you probably already know, that only 2% of people are members of political parties. And if you think that that doesn't really matter, um, ask yourself, how is the political discourse of this time created? It's generated from the 2% of people who think it's worth the time and effort to belong to a political party. And the media feeds on that discourse. And that in a sense is where we feel power lies, the story of our, as citizens, our powerlessness. So one of the first questions that we looked into when we, when we first launched the alternative is, who is the human being at the heart of power? What is the idea of a human being, the very citizens that power is supposed to serve? 
And we saw very quickly that the idea of a human being in this old sense of power was homo economicus, you know, a customer for the business or a person that mostly needs material needs being met. But what we understood ourselves was that human beings are very complex beings. They not only have material needs, physical needs to be met by power, but they have emotional needs that are driving them and motivating them every day. And just to give you a quick glimpse, these are the nine essential emotional needs that the Human Givens uh, Psychotherapy School describes. I think you'd understand and recognize them all. But the other thing that this Human Givens Psychotherapy School suggests, which is almost absent completely from our current politics, is this idea that we as humans ourselves have the resources, we have the resources to be able to take some measure of control over our lives and to be able to decide our own futures. So this, what's happened in the absence of this acknowledgement of our own resources is that we really live in this, you know, in this landscape of constant dreaming and yearning for a better future that we don't have any tools to make possible. Instead of that, we're living in a social media network, if you like, or a media network of a dream that somebody else has created for us. And that is very much built on the idea that if we buy things and we consume things, that somehow our yearnings and our emotional needs will get met. This is what soft power is, and it's a, a form of power that really defines the, the space of possibility. So when we wake up to this, when we start to notice what it is that's manipulating us, or that's creating or shaping the dreams that we think we're free to have ourselves, what are we really waking up to? And this is what is really at the heart of the alternative. This, this new axis really of how our power is being manipulated or shaped by others to create futures that we don't really want. But it's also the source of our reconnecting ourselves to our own power to get the future that we want. So right at the core, our psychosocial health, our sense of divided powerless communities and a dying planet, that is the story that we have, it's on the left. And what we're offering is this new sense of our holistic human agency reconnected uh, through our communities to a powerful future that we could all be part of. And at the heart of this, seems a very simple thing. If we have been divided, then relationship itself, us coming into better connection with each other, that is the rebel act. That is the very thing that we could be doing. And after a couple of years of being at the alternative, we understood that building containers for people to move into relationship with each other, what we call citizens action networks, it's a generic term could describe any of these things, any ways of people coming together to move into relationship gives rise to these new possibilities. I'm just flashing through this now to give you a very broad sense of all the stuff that's out there that is trying now to reconnect the idea of human agency to a much better future. This stuff is out there and we're championing this. This is what the alternative is for. And then in case any of you are wondering, how do we scale this up? Our sense is that it's a fractal agency where we build relationships and those relationships work, other people want to copy them. That is the exponential power of building relationship. So that's basically it. This is just the front page of our website to give you a sense of what, what we do. And I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I hope that was just a really good, you know, flash introduction to what the alternative UK is. What we're going to do today is we're going to visit a little bit more slowly these three domains of the I, the we and the world um, through the agency and through the hard work of the people who are working in what seem like separate domains but in fact we're all moving into connection with each other so that there is a holistic sense that we can carry around with us that everything I'm doing as an individual has collective agency and has an impact on the planet. So on that note, 
My first person I'd like to introduce to all of us is Alana Bloom, who comes from uh, uh, an organization called Enroll Yourself. And I'm going to invite Alana now to um, explain how she fulfills that eye space in the eye we world axis. Alana. Mm. Thanks, Indra. Really great to see it framed like that. And hello, everybody. Really grateful to be here. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. So just give me one second. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm here mostly to talk a bit about my story because I feel like my story has been one around um, developing the I in connection with the, the we and the world. And um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in this question about where does the power lie? Because I think had you asked that question to me maybe two or three years ago, my, my, question, my, my answer would be very different to what it is now. Um, because I've had, I feel like I've had a number of experiences that have really enabled me to develop my sense of agency in the world. Um, so starting with, with my story and, and kind of my background, um, my, I, I basically started my, my career as it were in, in creativity, in performance and specifically creating work around the climate crisis and extinction through physical theater and, and lots of different kinds of performances and labs. Um, and this was an amazing time for me because it was one of just like uh, abundant creativity. And I think it's been the foundations of a lot of my work and a lot of my approach currently. And that space allowed me to run multiple labs and retreat and, and spaces where we were looking at um, creativity and, and looking at performance. And that was when my facilitation journey began and, and in 2000 kind of led me to enroll yourself. So in 2019, after a number of years of these explorations, I, um, I started working with Enroll Yourself, who's founded by Zara Davidson and is essentially a peer to peer learning organization that we run something called the Learning Marathon, which is a, is a container, is a space to um, to tackle steep learning curves together with people. Um, and this, this journey with Enroll Yourself has opened up multiple possibilities for me. And coincidentally, at the same time I, I got involved with Enroll Yourself, I also spent a year working with Extinction Rebellion and really dived into um, seeing the, the systemic problems. And this weaving journey um, and enroll yourself, I, I facilitated a learning marathon and through that learning marathon, coinciding with this work with Extinction Rebellion, I founded Regenerating Rhythms, which is all about focusing and balancing the inner and outer activism that's needed for, for systemic change. And that's been a whole journey and has led me at the beginning of the pandemic to move to Devon and really supported me all these different things that have happened have supported me with the, the tools and agency and creativity to become co-director of the Living Project, which is a, which is a, a land-based um, learning, growing, regenerative community. So I want to kind of lay that out because I feel like all are, all have been experiences that have been focused on the eye, but they're also, and have been focused on developing my agency, but they're also connected to the we and to the world. And I guess a lot of that, a lot of what I understand now around learning and around agency has been through Enroll Yourself and has been through this process. So I, I wanted to kind of share a, a little of my, the things that I carry with me from, from this journey with Enroll Yourself. And I guess the thing that really first struck me about what we do was, was around education and money and privilege. And I guess, education can be really out of reach for a lot of people if especially if there's not um the financial stability and money available you know a master's is just like it, it's not possible and enroll and the learning marathon has been compared to like a mini masters a mini choose your own masters and i love that that idea that 
actually like education doesn't need to be something that's prescript and designed for us but actually we can design our own education and that peer-to-peer -peer learning makes that accessible it makes it affordable and it brings education uh it transforms education into learning and like the ability to learn i, I think that's another thing that really struck me is how learning how to learn is um is something we don't all know how to do because learning will, cut, will be very different for, for for all of us and uh the education system is is kind of designed for us to like take information in and to be able to kind of complete uh exams and and show that we have that information but actually learning is so much more than that learning is has multiple different levels that go from embodiment to imagination to to all different sorts of levels so that's that's been another a big piece um and then i guess yeah the sense of of agency and resilience that peer groups support that that they can this container for that um resilience is about being a, a, able to adapt being flexible and i think peer-to-peer -peer learning really enables that because you're constantly adapting you're constantly in enroll yourself we're led in the learning marathon you choose a question and you're led by that question and so that question might throw you a curveball halfway through your process and so how do you adapt and move with that um and i think you through having your own question you really get to develop a sense of agency of like okay what do i want to learn about what what is important to me how can i um depending on the question like how can i enact change with that um how can i really understand that question and through all of those mediums you it feels I mean, my own experiences, I, I feel like I'm able to do something about that. Um, and then I guess one thing I want to talk about is within the learning marathon as well, within, within Enroll Yourself is a, around agency. And agency is, is described as the capacity for individuals to act independently and make their own free choices. And so it's important when we talk about agency that we also acknowledge that there are ways in which our system affects agency. Um, the structures that um, might determine or limit a way someone is, in, is enabled to, to enact agency. And this is really important because I think what, one thing that I've learned within Enroll Yourself is actually the, the diversity of, of our social class, our religion, our gender, our ethnicity, our ability, our customs. They create th these incredible fertile environments for learning. They're, they're probably one of the most um advanced spaces for learning in my in my view and i think we also can can see how our agency can uh approach and shift those structures and systems so that other people that may be limited uh can it can have a, an increased sense of agency um so my own experience with this like i didn't think that i when I started the, le the learning marathon and my own journey with Enroll Yourself, like I never knew what I would come out and create with that. But the intersections of all the things that I um, have experienced over the past couple of years really led me to understand how um, our inner activism is part of these wider social systemic change that we're all building. That actually I am a mirror, <laughs> my, my, my inner life, the I is a mirror of the systems that are around me. And actually in order to dismantle or to sh shape those systems, I can also choose to shape, shape the self. And this is what led me to creating Regenerating Rhythms, which is very much a project that came through from Enroll Yourself and from the Learning Marathon. Um, and it's been my own story of, of kind of experiencing, experiencing agency. And I guess one thing to talk about also is is the possibilities of potential and and how the learning marathon really is a like I keep talking about container I really feel that it is this container for many different things and not the kind of potential is that we see of like success or you know these kind of maybe old paradigm ways of, of viewing potential but actually potential being uh in my story like my experience to my my ability to be in service to life, um, to be in service to something much bigger than myself, and that potential being very unique to each person, 
and what are those possibilities of potential that are contained with each input with, within each of us and actually like what if we have all all have that infinite potential but we just lack the support and the structures to access that potential and I feel like the learning marathon and enroll yourself is really looking at that how those peer-to-peer -peer relationships how those this container can support us to access that potential and then what comes from that potential will be a, a, a multiplicity of projects and ideas and creativity and imagination that are actually so necessary to transforming the system and that potential is also about about the the personal work about the, the inner activism um so and yeah, I, I, I wrote a piece for The Alternative um, last year around like, what if we shifted focus from perpetual economic growth to like the growth of people's potential and what would our society look like then? And I, I, I don't have the answer, but I know that that peer-to-peer -peer learning spaces support us to discover the answers to those questions and really embody them, not in a way that's super intellectual, but it's actually just lived because it's it's what we're living in in these peer groups um so i hope i've done i hope i've done some justice to to the topic of i and agency and um i'm really like open to hear i'd love to hear from people and, and feedback um i know indra's going to ask me a few questions now so um but yeah i'm really up for conversations around this and around other people's experience and stories of agency as well so yeah, that's, that's that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, and, and and I wonder if you yourself have ever thought about politics and power, um, and in, in in what way you can describe um, everything that you're doing um, as actually the new idea of what a citizen is. Mm. Because when I was listening to you just now, I was thinking there might be many people in this room. Uh, already, especially from transition towns, who maybe do um, a personal practice, or they may they may be quite internally orientated quite well. But when we really think about everyone, mm. you know, in the country or you know, or, or across countries, um, having that as their focus, you know, that's what excites me. And and and, and do you have a have, have a chance to talk to political uh, types, or you know, what what has been your interface with politics? With politics, well, I guess, you know, I'm enraged at, at politics quite regularly, which I think most people are these days. And um, I guess my own sense with these peer to peer, with, with Enroll Yourself, with the work that I'm doing is that it's slower work and, but it does build it it builds autonomy like uh, the, the thing that springs to mind is um we enroll yourself was running this thing with friends of the earth which was a uh, a project around women moving money from like divesting their money from um banks and organizations that fund fossil fuels into green investment and i can't remember the exact figures and i'm uh, i'll be loath to quote them wrong but it's something like it's multiple thousands and thousands of pounds that ha have been managed to be moved just through small groups of people learning from each other and, and empowering one, one another and giving each other agency. And if we scale this project, we could move millions in the next 10 years. And so for me, that's political. That's, that's about taking our money, taking our power and putting it into um, choosing where we put that money, choosing uh having that choice and so in terms of yeah i feel like that is a political act to have that that kind of level of agency to see where how how am i can kind of contributing to this system um in all these different ways and how can my uh how can these peer-to-peer -peer relationships actually enable me to make those choices in the direction that i want i want to move in um so I hope that answers your question. No, but no, that was the thing that, that jumped to mind. No, no, it absolutely does, because it reminds me also that, you know, that with, with Brexit, the 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 slogan was, you know, take back control. And yet, you know, it was never really investigated as as 
individuals taking back control, mm. more, obviously as a nation we're taking back control from another group of nations, so to speak, this is an idea, but the notion that we're taking back control for ourselves and what you described as the personal is political, I think, I think that that's what comes out so strongly from what you're saying, you use the word autonomy, mm. you know, that you're building autonomy. So is that something that you feel grows in your groups that there, is there a sense amongst the people that you're you know, enrolled with Mm. That they are being this this is a political act i think I think it's subtle. I don't think it's overt. I think if if you were to ask the 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 kind of community like do you see um enroll yourself as like is it political it, it, on the outside it might you might say no, not really, but actually um I believe that having like reclaiming learning spaces being able to pull together resources that regardless of money, regardless of finances, also regardless of your, your, your background or your skill, like, I feel like that is political because it's sharing power. Like that, that's maybe something that I didn't speak about, but within the learning marathon, you pull together your resources and you co-create your, your, your pedagogy. And each person has a skill to offer. Each person has something to give to that collective space. But it's going to look completely different for each person, right? And I, I think that that skill sharing, that's that sharing of, of skill is, is power sharing. And it's actually like enabling um, learning that might not otherwise happen. Like it also reminds me that like in, in these spaces, you're perhaps not always with people that are like you you're you're the, the the beauty is the diversity and so you're not in an echo chamber so actually that that creates this kind of like expanding the sense of expansion around ideas and discourse and and being able to have difficult conversations and i think that that is a, that is an act of, of that is very political actually is being able to hold complexity being able to hold difficult conversations even though we might not agree um, yeah, I love that. Thank you very much. And that was a great kickoff to um, to this whole series that brings together the I, the we in the world. So now I'm going to uh, hand over to a political duo of kinds. Um, so I'm handing over to Anaya from Trust the People and Peter McFadden from Flatpak Democracy. And they're going to describe their relationship. Over to you, Anaya. Great, thanks Indra and thanks Lana, that was really interesting to listen to. Um, what I'll do is I'll first, sh um, I'm going to share my screen, <laughs> so you get used to the sh screen sharing, and tell you a little bit about Trust the People, um, just because some of you may not know about this movement. And we are a movement of community builders that are looking to reshape our democracy from the bottom up um, and to just build a compassionate society that serves the needs of the people and the planet, um, which isn't the case at the moment. Um, and a bit about where we started. We started in um, Extinction Rebellion's Future Democracy Hub, um, and we now work with loads of different movements. So we're still connected to the Future Democracy Hub, but we um, extend far beyond and work with a lot of people that aren't connected to Extinction Rebellion. And we really, kicked off our current project in its form uh, last year um, during the pandemic, um, although we'd kind of been uh, thinking about ways that we could transform our democracy before, but it, with the pandemic, it really felt that we were just hitting this point where it was like, well, we can, we can choose the direction that our society goes in. And, and we're also kind of running out of time when we're thinking about the climate crisis. And, um, and we can choose to create a society that is more equal because it's so unequal now. Power is concentrated in the hands of few, like billionaires have earned so much more money in this past year and countless people have lost their jobs. Um, we are facing a climate and ec ecological emergency. Um, and it's just not a fair system that is allowing everyone to thrive. So this kind of despair of this and awareness that maybe COVID uh, was gonna give us a chance to change things um, was what really pushed us into creating uh, a course um, around how we can reshape our democracy and work with others. Um, and just um, a little bit about what we do. So we share tools to help people support their communities in the face of local and global crises. Um, 
a lot of these are about promoting democratic methods like people's assembly. So ensuring that we have a real democracy. Um, and we have a free online education course to support this, uh, but we're also helping kind of to build, helping to build a movement of movements. So we're collaborating with other organizations that are doing incredible work as well. Um, and a really quick move about the course before I pass over to Peter. Uh, our, it's split into five modules, uh, but it's an eight week course. And our first module is about connecting with ourselves and thinking about our identity, our biases, how this shapes who we are and our relationship to others in society. Um, then we look at how we can go out and connect with people in our communities and ensure that we're listening to those who, who tend to have been ignored uh, and incorporating them. Uh, we look at then how you can work effectively in teams and build empathetic uh, teams that, are, that support each other um, and that, that help, uh, that can achieve their aims. Um, then we teach people about community assemblies, so how you can run people's assemblies in your communities and how they're this kind of fantastic tool that enables everyone to, to be listened to in, in a held space. Um, then community organizing, so looking at all these different things that we can do to go and shape our communities. And we've just, in this course that we're running at the moment, added a project week. And this is um, a chance for us to uh, platform a lot of organizations that are doing incredible work in community or community organizing already. So we're working with Flatpak, uh, with climate emergency centers, with incredible edible, I think um, Time Bank in a whole, whole Time Bank are gonna be running a session. So just lots of fantastic organizations that are gonna hopefully inspire the people who are on the courses. And we're currently running the third course um, of our Kind of since we started doing it last year and they've gone really well and and we have a lot of people on them and they're completely free and they're also spaces of incredible hope uh, i mean it's quite a bleak time but they get off a hope so that's a really quick summary of trust the people uh, and you can find out more at trust the people earth um but yeah i'll pass over to peter because we work really closely with flat pack democracy thanks very much Amira. am i am i oh i am unmuted Hooray, well done. After a year and a half, I've managed to unmute myself. <laughs> um, uh, while you were talking, I was thinking, I mean, we'll come in a moment to why we need each other um, as organisations. But I was also thinking, uh, it's like, is Flatpak, I'm still not sure what Flatpak is other than a book, um, in the sense of whether it's a movement, uh, you know, what it, what it is. It's a book because I wrote it as a book, which was about my experiences as a as a town councillor and how to gain power and do things differently. But the origins of that are, are, are potentially interesting to people of, uh, with a transition background, because I, I had started um, the transition town group in Froome. Um, uh, where are we now? Gosh, about 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and in that process, in the original um, ideas within the transition town movement was that, that uh, you went and, and um, developed a relationship with your town council. So I went to the town council and found um, found something which was very unambitious and in terms of the environment was seriously unambitious. It was, we run a park and we've got allotments and now please go away and stop annoying us. Um, and so, you know, I was moaning about that um, to a bunch of people who, who also had feelings that the town, our town council was quite unambitious and, and could do more and had got, got tangled really in the political bit um, which we were talking about before, which in the sense that um, they spent most of their time just arguing with each other. And so, so we had a sort of mini version of Westminster going on in Froome where people um, just, as I say, um, were, were mostly engaged with, with um, conflict and confrontation. And what that led to was a bunch of people who'd never been politicians before or local politicians um, standing um, really, I mean, initially, kind of as a joke, just to up the game, and then getting elected and finding ourselves running through, and then finding that um, what we thought or what most people think of are, are rules are not rules, and that actually uh, they're guidance. And of course, there are rules about what you have to do as a, as a council in terms of when you have meetings um, and uh, things like accounts, and perfectly reasonably, it's public money you're spending. Um, but most of it is is just guidance. And so we set about ripping the whole thing to, uh, apart really and the main things we did were to say that actually funnily enough uh trust the people and i it was a phrase which i'd used in fact you know i have used over many years and 
our experience was that if you trust the people, they turn out to know lots and to have all sorts of wisdom, which actually, funnily enough, the representatives don't. I, I, think, I increasingly believe that representative democracy is a complete farce, that the idea that you can select someone and give away all your power to them to make decisions for you is, is a nonsense. And it's more and more of a nonsense as time goes by, because actually the public get cleverer not only at a really local, at a micro level, because I know more about Nunny Road, where I'm talking from, than people who don't live in Nunny Road. You know, I, and it's like I know the most about here, but also there are things within my life in Froome that I, I know more about uh, than councillors, let's say. Um, I probably know more about compost than any of our current councillors, you know. So why they shouldn't be making decisions about compost. They should be, they should be putting that back out to the community and trusting the people. And, you know, I'm not going to talk for much longer, really, because that's essentially is, is the main thing that we did was try and massively increase the, um, the level of participation within the community. And to do that, but I think that the main thing that we did over 10 years was to hugely reduce the, 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 the levels of formality. So to try, try and make it so that people felt able to come to the, to the town council. So it became, it became, the town council became something which was owned by the people, if you like. It was our council rather than the council. And it changes the relationship between the council. It just means that the council is there to catalyze, to support, to encourage, to say yes. And it's not there to, to, to take power in any way and then redistribute it. Um, and, and you know, we managed to do that in, in all sorts of ways, not perfectly by, by any means. And then Flatback um, as a book, um, enabled or, or seeded those ideas out to various other um, places who have taken on that idea and many of them have, have done the same thing in different ways and many of them have built on it and there are some standing in May and I and a group of others have been running a, a campaign to try and support groups of people who want to, um, to stand in May to do the same kind of thing, essentially work together as a group of individuals for their community but crucially trust the people. So why do you need flat pack, Anaira? <laughs> why do we need flat pack? <laughs> uh, well, for so many of the reasons that you just said, that um, when you have people standing as independents and I guess really making an effort to represent their community, then they can bring in change that makes something more inclusive. I mean, I, with what you're saying about kind of changing all these traditions that exist, um like some things are so alienating and they keep people out of getting involved in politics and um and it makes it if you have people going in wanting to actually be brave and change things um then that means that more more and more people will get involved and the community will feel like it's their people's council and they feel they'll feel like they'll be able to go to the council and that they'll be listened to um i think when you if you have a flat pack council or maybe not in all cases but hopefully uh, if you have a flat pack council um and they they hold things like people's assemblies to get information get advice get ideas from the community um then it would just kind of yeah it's like a, a beautiful marriage of it feeling like uh people feel like they're being represented they're being listened to and um they're changing their community for the better because they know what needs to be changed um and it, it can alter people's relationship with power or their ideas of power anyway i think people have quite a toxic view of politics and power in this country and, that, and that's just because of how it's traditionally been run um and it doesn't have to be like that so right. i think it's yeah we need the bravery we need the inclusivity we need the the listening um really? definitely I, uh, no no i absolutely i agree with you and i think um that famous twitter link to or you know the thing which went viral of the the bit of zoom call in whatever the council was where they were all being particularly over the top um, and offensive in their aggressiveness to me that that's 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 actually not abnormal it may not be quite that bad, but what you said just then is you, there were, early on you said something like, um, hopefully, you know, a flat pack council, hopefully, um, you know, that they will behave differently. And that, for me, that's the crucial bit of where um, courses like that, which TTP is running and Trust the People is running, um, is so crucial. Because, again, it's a, a bit like I was saying, we shouldn't assume that the people we elect actually know anything. I mean, one of the things we said we said right at the beginning is, you know, thanks for electing us. We don't actually know anything. We're now going to come out and ask ask you. And the same applies to how do you how do you consult with your community? 
So I think one of the main bits, of, one of the main tools that trust the people um, trains people in is these people's assemblies. Is ways to to really sit down with people and and listen to them in properly interactive um, conversations where the power has been changed um, radically. And I think that um, that's where you know this sort of movement really needs trust the people because a new council coming in, why should we assume that they know any of this stuff? See what I mean? They don't. They won't have heard what a people's assembly is, or a citizens' assembly is, or how to run um, uh, all the things that transition towns run all the time. Uh, you, you know um, uh, that uh, open space meetings, that sort of things. All that will probably be, you know, totally new to most people who've just been elected as councillors. And that's where things like TTP are so essential. But we've got this fantastic opportunity at this moment because things like particularly mutual aid organisations and groups, but other groups, um, not only new ones, but old ones have had to step up over the last 18 months and have kind of done politics, actually. So they've, they've done it. And then there are town councils who can take advantage of that, but given the right encouragement and skills. And that's where, for me, TTP can be so crucial. And there are people, there's a number of people who've been trained, who've been through the TTP course, who are standing in places like Bude and Hexham, you know, in May, who, if they get in, I think will we'll really change the game. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But I do think if we are, and I mean, our dem democracy desperately needs shaping because all the crises we're kind of rebuilding, because all the crises we're facing are a failure of a democracy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if we're going to do that, we need all hands on deck. So we need people doing it, kind of connecting with their neighbours, building, kind of having mutual aid groups, harnessing their own power, and then also using the power structures that exist and um, helping to kind of, yeah, re reform them or just kind of like invigorate them and bring them into the 21st century. Um, and then hopefully we can <laughs> challenge these crises that we're facing and overcome them. Sure. Because I think I, I put it in the chat, but I think when when Alana said I'm I'm, arranged, uh, I'm enraged with politics, uh, I don't you know, and and she agreed in a moment a moment later. It's like it's not the it's the systems and the fact that it's that two percent thing that um uh you know that Indra mentioned earlier that, that we've somehow we've given away our power to this tiny tum number of people who have this system which is incredibly difficult to get into. Um, you know, if you go to most town council meetings, even you have to book in. You're allowed two minutes to speak. You have to stand there quivering with fear, um, you know, and then the councillors don't even have to, to, to respond at all. All of that's bollocks and it doesn't have to exist. You know, it's not those. That's one of the things that's not a rule. You can get rid of all of that as we did. And when we did it, people said, whoa, you're mad. You're going to get you. People will come in and they'll just rant away at you for ages. You know, they'll, they'll you know. But in a sense, we trusted the people. And in the eight years I was a councillor, it was never abused. You know, sometimes whoever was chairing might go, you know, OK, um, you know, and I, we, you know, we've got that now. We've agreed to do this, you know, and we need to move on. But but that was, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, great. Thanks. You know, they, they were, by 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 showing respect and trusting people, we got the best out of them. And we got 70, 80 people coming to meetings, council meetings, when most council meetings have, you know, one member of the public if they're lucky. Yeah, there's something that really struck me kind of in the summer, Peter was interviewing uh, uh, people from different flatback councils across the country. And I guess this to me is like the perfect example of trusting the people and having things change. And I think it was a council in Portishead where they needed to raise their local taxes, their council taxes, because they just weren't bringing in enough money. And they gave the community an option and they gave them information being like, if we raise them this amount, then you can have this we raise them this amount you can have this and then and they gave them I think three tiers and I think it was like a unanimous vote that everyone voted to raise them to their maximum amount so raise their taxes the highest that they suggested but because they were the community who knew where that money was going because they felt invested in the decision and because they'd been trusted to be consulted like everyone wanted that because they felt that it was for the best of the community and that to me just kind of captures the magic that you can do when you involve communities in um, decision making processes and in the political system and make them feel like they they have a part to play they'll feel more invested in, and want the best for people absolutely um, but for me there's an we're in one of those little moments now there's a there's a build back mo a better moment there's a 
you know, upside of down. I mean, we've been through, well, we haven't been through yet, but we, uh, the last, whatever it is, eight year, a bit more of, of, of crisis and lockdowns, there's been lots of relearning as we come out of it. There's this extraordinary opportunity to, to recognize what ordinary people have done to keep that situation, to, you know, to, to really build on that. And it, it's so frustrating because in so many ways I see that disappearing. But things like, for me, things like Trust the People, which has now what had how many people have been through courses? Through the, uh, several hundred now. We got yeah um, on the one some of the calls we had for a week or so ago I had 140 people on the call and we run them twice a week. So, yeah. yeah, we've had several hundred people go through the courses. Yeah, and so those people are back out into their community. Well, over the three courses, it's been more like 300, if not if not more. So um, so yeah, more and more. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like, um, uh, I think that's really important to have seeded in because this power has been taken on us for so long. Uh, Mike in the chat said, you know, um, uh, power lies with the descendants of friends of William the Conqueror. And, um, you know, it's been a long time that we haven't had power. I think it's been taken from us and we've allowed that to happen. And, um, and, and what, what you're doing is, is helping to to re-educate people. And I think all that, that Flatpak's doing is saying, look, actually, there's one place that you might want, you might be able to do something with this power, if you like. And if you do, it can enable a community to change the game, to put the resources back into people in, in a different way. And that's money and time, uh, which can make a real difference to, to projects. One of the frustrations for me in the transition time movement in Britain that was that we weren't able we, went, we had so many ideas, but we didn't have the money or, the, or the, the staff to make them happen. And because we've had the money and the, and the staff through, you know, we had two, well, we have two resilience officers, significant amount of money, really early declarations of climate um, crisis, that sort of thing. Um, because the council is behind it, you can get so much more done. So these things can be, well, as you say, a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to come back in here now uh, and say thanks very much. I really enjoyed your conversation. I, I didn't think you had any relationship counselling needed there. Uh, you seem to make a perfect partnership. Thanks. Um, and I just want to sort of put the bits together again for everybody who's been listening or for anybody who's come in a bit late, that we were comparing really the, pl the plight of the citizen completely not only alienated from their community, but even alienated from themselves you know, living in a world of media that's been manipulating them and telling them what they want, and then only every five years or so having a chance to say, I choose this party over that one, not knowing what that means hardly, um, and then having no power locally. And now what we're describing is the revolution really at the heart of the system. And starting with Alana, we're talking about how every single individual, you know, now lives in a world where they can begin to uh, re-educate themselves and be, begin to discover their own agency in relationship with others. So that's the first important bit of relationship building. We're talking about the internal relationship, knowing yourself, discovering your desire and agency, and then moving out into relationship with others. And then knowing, imagine if you knew that somewhere around you, there was a citizens action network of the kind that Anaira has been uh, um, describing and trust the people, Transition Towns is also that kind of a citizen's action network where you can meet, move into a container where people are already talking to each other, already having uh, discussions and taking votes on things. Imagine if everyone in the country had one of those containers, right? And then from that container to have the imagination and the toolbox and the capability of taking over your local council, which then becomes your local council literally of the people and by the people. So this is the sort of uh, revolution that we're trying to point at that is already happening at the heart of our political system. So at that point, we just want to stop for five minutes, give you a chance to have a bit of a break from the screen and a bit of a break from us. Please come back at five past four um, and then you'll be in for another piece of the revolution that is already occurring in our political system. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Great to see you all again. Such a relief to know that you're still there. <laughs> you all disappear for a moment and that, but actually you were there all the time. So it's great to see you and I hope you've had some good discussions. Um, we're going to um, invite you again to put 
uh, thoughts and questions into the chat box. Um, we will have a chance to for you to put questions to any one of our group, um, but I'd like to just uh, now make way for the last piece of the puzzle. Um, and I'm going to introduce to you uh, Pat Kane, who's the co-initiator of the Alternative UK alongside myself. And Pat um, is also a singer songwriter and the author of a book called The Play Ethic. And um, Pat has been the editor of The Daily Alternative for the past four years, quite a feat. So um, Pat, over to you for the, your part in the I, we world, which would be the world. Hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, such a stimulating uh, two hours, uh, one and a half hours so far. Uh, yes, as Indra says, I'm going to talk a bit about the world part of I, we world. Um, it's, it'll be uh, slightly by means of a slightly different discussion. Usually when when we talk about it, when people talk about the I, we world relationship, world is presumed to be uh, about e ecology and environment and, and the climate crisis, and rightly so. But an I, we world relationship is also about, funny enough, our media. Um, and in two senses of the word, because clearly uh, the media that, that penetrates into our consciousness, that tries to shape our actions, that our, our actions are actually a part of, in our local world, in our living room, you know, is is directed and shaped by uh, global forces and by and by uh, from places like California or China or Estonia or whatever. Um, so that's the world is is entirely with us and questions about where the power lies in the world is entirely a question about how we use our media but the other aspect of world that i want to talk about is the way that the media creates a mental world the posh word is epistemological but it creates a, a world of coherent truths and is often doing so in um, pernicious and challenging ways and so the question that these slides will race through and partly based on what we actually have tried to do with ourselves uh, with the alternative over the last couple of years is what's the kind of big structures, alternative big structures that we need and what is the kind of world, coherent mental, emotional world that you might want to create within those alternative structures to really propel uh, and enhance change. And that's change at the level of Alana's level, which is sort of self-learning and that's change at the level of the flat pack and trusted people level, which is when it's communities taking power. So there's a sort of last piece in the chain, which is about how we command our own minds as much as commanding anything else. So um, I'll hopefully make this work as usual. It doesn't. Here we go. So um, three parts. I'll race through it. And then I think Andrew will ask me sort of questions about the world aspect of the IV world power access uh, at the end. I'm going to talk about the current landscape of media. I'm going to talk about how the Alternative UK has responded to it with limited resources, but with a lot of ingenuity. And then third, I'll talk about elements of a new and alternative media system, as I said before. So our current landscape, very quick, uh, uh, brusque trot through it. We know what the establishment oriented commercial press and print and digital do. We know who owns them. We know what their message is about. Um, the BBC Channel 4 are both under a state charter to be plural and fair. Are they plural and fair in practice? Uh, there are some new players coming. There's, a, there's a, a crisis of media coming with the new populist broadcast channels called GB News and News UK, um, which are kind of maybe building on what LBC is trying to do. That's a real challenge. Um, there is some enterprise around progressive news titles, you might call them that. The New, Euro new European has been bought by new people. Uh, there's byline news, there's positive news, there's the Guardian constantly crowdfunding. So that's the kind of a part of the current landscape. But also a part of the current landscape is that social media, I call it a kind of cyclotron. It makes cash from chaos. As Malcolm McLaren used to say about punk rock, it makes, it makes profit from polarisation. Um, which generates clicks and ad information, uh, which can be sold to advertisers. What's the effect of this? Drains our energy, makes us manipulable, makes us disempowered. Interesting that they kind of woke from their slumber about their model with 
Trump and uh, the attack on capital with the threat of violence hanging over them. But at the very least, what this suggests is that something's coming next. It's either more regulation of this media or it's new business models or something. But we, we, we can't go on serenely just accepting the role of social media and social networks in their lives. Something's got to change. Another aspect of the, of the current situation is these dark information wars that we are wrapped up in. There are digital players, state and non-state. Used to, we used to call this propaganda, but in any case, now it's turbocharged, sending out useful and strategic truths. People are taking opportunities here to create what people have called an epistemic crisis, posh word, more banal word, fake news, to sort of feed conspiracy, to generate conspiracies uh, amongst populations uh, for profit and power. So that's that's the kind of an image of the landscape that we're in. And one that isn't often mentioned is um, advertising and marketing, uh, which is sitting behind what looks like the way that citizens deal with information through their news, shaping affect, shaping emotion, um, playing into that cognitive science theory that what you feel first is what you then base your choice of facts upon, so feels over reels. So we, I think it's a big question for everybody who's involved in communications of whatever kind and certainly trying to communicate our, our future. How do we deal with this question that very powerful people are priming people emotionally to go and seek facts that make sense to them? Do we get involved in that world? As an, I think that's an interesting question. Um, but as I say, there's world in both of its senses dealing with big systems and also dealing with people's world of meaning. Do we, How do we get involved in that? Okay, um, so how have we sort of tried to respond to that? And in a way, how are we all trying to respond to it by availing ourselves of the tools at hand? Is to try to tell a new story about us, a new story about us, the we, uh, and also to evoke a different future that's possible. We have decided with the obvious pun or the obvious journalistic bun, pun, not to do a Daily Mail or a Daily Express, but a Daily Alternative. It's, uh, it commissions, it curates, it aggregates stuff that's already out there in news and views. It has a kind of, again, a, to use the posh words, epistemic ontological challenge. You know, why don't you try and live, think and feel and act in this world, not that one? Is that positive news? Is it, as Alana was saying, is it human potential news? Is it? Do we need news that would allow us to explore human potential? Maybe that's something we could fight for. Um, and again, we consciously are trying to build a political axis around IWE world. We're trying to connect up flourishing of individual community and planet, make all that connected. You know, uh, to put it bluntly, the capitalist media with their investment structures are doing that for their media. There's an implicit assumption of how the world works in their media. It's very reasonable, and we're very explicit with this in the alternative, that you could come up with a different assumption and have a different agenda. We're post-media studies in that sense. Um, but be, be aware of it and construct it well, and construct it uh, justly. Um, and just another small thing that what we do is we taxonomize rigorously and ruthlessly, which is the idea that you make sure that every time you post something, it's tied to a useful concept. So that when you do that over four years, you can send that concept to people and you have 50, 60, 100 ideas that they can then work on. It might seem like a very librarianish point. It's actually it's fundamental. It's a way of uh, dealing with the overwhelming knowledge production of the moment and trying to make it useful, trying to turn it into tools for people to use where they are. So taxonomizing seems boring, seems librarian-like. It's actually incredibly important. And you'll see just below there, we have very, very strong entry points to the site, come into this site to tell the story, to share learning, to build economies, create the fuel. So we're just you know, trying to avail ourselves of the best um, conventional techniques. But we also try to do different stuff, um, stuff you're doing, you're, many of you are creating action forums like we are on sites like Lumio and Nudge and many others. Um, we are finding that they are petri dishes, crucibles, incubators for new projects. That obviously relates to the daily alternative because we want to try to make every daily alternative story become an action and Lumio is a place where that action often coagulates and, and emerges. Uh, well, here we are on Zoom. We Everybody can now set up their own discussion channel. We did so with with the Elephant Speaks, which is something you can find on the site, um, which is about 
really consciously curating system perceivers and system changers and allowing them to talk at the level they want to talk at. Uh, okay, hold on. Yep. Um, we've been trying quirky stuff. We, we found a way to put an app out, out on the web out of HTML5 and called it Before and Now, which is going, which is running at the moment. And it was an app that gathered feelings about feelings about the shift that COVID implies. And it's actually a really fascinating read through. Um, but again, we're trying to kind of relate to media in terms of, well, let's catch people where their passions are and let's see how, what we can unfold out of that place. Um, we've also done work, we, I suppose you could call it multimedia platform work, but we're, we don't have you know countless Ks of cash to invest. So we use existing tools like Google Docs, Zoom, Miro, even IBM Watson. And we've dealt with communities specifically in um, Plymouth, uh, around uh, the question of how they're coping under COVID, and we did that work for the local trust. And it, and it, I just we just cite it because it just shows you what's out there. We literally have a plenitude of tools around about us, and with a with a bit of goodwill and a bit of strong uh, b uh, culture and rules of behaviour, you can do you can make amazing things, amazing conventions and convenings happen. And then just finally, the people who come, so many people come to talk to us who are saying we are building a new platform. And it's just an alert to say media is one thing, but platform is another. And the platform enables a culture of activity. So anybody who has platform ambition rather than just website ambition or blog ambition or social media ambition, it's important. Um, but the question of how you build that platform is a big question. It's a big question about money and talent. Um, but there's a lot of people, even as refugees from the corporate sector who want to build different platforms, we can connect you with them. We can convene these meetings, but they're definitely there. They're definitely there. Okay. So we, you know, with this is us asking how we do our thing 10, 100 times better. Please support us. Um, just to kind of quickly get to the end. So what would this imply for creating a new media system, a new relationship between I, we and world in terms of informing the citizen and giving them or allowing them to discover the information to act well one thing is do we think about strategies for feels as well as reels for emotional addresses to people which which are rich and moving and so powerful powerful enough uh, that they can act in a way that addresses an ipcc 10-year climate deadline for example People might have to be ambitious about news brands. I mean, really poetically ambitious about new news brands. The current ones, I mean, I'll just name the titles of the ones that are in the environment at the moment. Tortoise, Correspondent, Byline, Canary, Double Down. I mean, it's quite dreadfully drear as a, as a way of thinking about a brand that attracts you to a news and views agenda. Can we be as bold? How bold should we be? I mean, really how poetic, how much, how deep do we go into the human condition and pull up beautiful images and phrases that would be the title of our new form of news media um i i would also alert everyone if they know people in the advertising industries or in the creative industries they are they're desperate to help and and i don't think we've built the right conduits between that community and our communities and they are just generating forms all the time they're often not very happy with what they're doing generating it for you know, Audi, what Bosch, whatever it is. So I think we should be having better conversations with the creative classes and with the creatives. I think they, I think they're bursting to be involved. Um, and then just finally, um, I think this is a really totally germane question to uh, our previous two uh, stages of the political axis, which is to do with what do you build to engender certain kinds of activity you know, to take us forward in a planet friendly way and how a media is organized, who it involves, what it does with its data is crucial and actually will broadly determine its content. And so medias that are media that's run as cooperatives or mutuals or as commons for content makers and with content users, um, it all fits together. I mean, and I think there's, there's, there's like unthinkable kinds of media content that could come if the media was arranged in a participative commons-like way. Uh, Dan Hyde, Dan Hyde, the media analyst says, you know, what would it be like to have a running alongside other media, a non-manipulative media sent, uh, sector? 
you know, that did different things with data, that explored new subscription and investment systems, that talked to philanthropists in a different way, you know, and, and even big capital in a different way, you know, if capital's disinvesting from stranded toxic assets in oil, could they then also disinvest from toxic media, toxic media ecology as much as toxic natural ecology, and, and serve the future? If, it's, if they can do it for renewable energy, why can't they do it for re renewable minds and hearts? Um, and just, Thanks, I, think that, I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. That was brilliant. Okay, thank thank you. you. Okay. Sharing. That's great. Thank you so much. That was, um, I think that's a piece of the puzzle that very often is missing from the conversation about our own empowerment. Um, and when we think about how our empowerment shifts to a much broader empowerment, um, it's to do with what is the story we're all telling ourselves about. So if in some uh, communities, people are beginning to organize themselves as they are with the COVID networks, but they can't really read about themselves or read about how the impact of their own waking up to their own agency uh, is being shared across the country, then it's very easy to get discour discouraged again, or worse than that, the sense that nothing will ever change. So this, the role of this um, new media, I think, uh, is absolutely crucial in the new power access. Pat, just before we go into questions, which we're about to do, uh, to take questions from everyone here to all the people who have spoken, could you just say a little bit about the fact that amongst the things that you cover in the Daily Alternative, um, where does this idea of cosmolocalism fit in? If you, and maybe we have to try and keep that brief because it's quite core, but it's if you can somehow describe it for people and how it relates sure. to the media. Well, cosmolocalism comes from the work of the Peer to Peer Foundation, um, which is founded by Michelle Bowens. And originally it's a kind of manufacturing model. Um, and I think the phrase is DGML, design global, make local. And so the whole idea is that you have um, a global resource of ideas and designs generated put up to the cloud that localities and communities can pull down from that cosmos and use i mean the classic story which of course COVID has absolutely highlighted you know is when medical supplies were choked in the pipeline you know a local school would talk to the science teacher who would use the 3d printer to make the masks to give to the hospital that the that the doctor had asked for so that's just this beautiful emergent structure that comes out. I mean, there's also a wonderful story that we just told about how, how a, um, a guy on TikTok was complaining that the pills, his Parkinson's pills just kept, you know, falling out of the pack. Why don't people design proper Parkinson's pill boxes? Another guy who was a country music video maker, skilled himself up, made the wireframe, asked for help, got the help, people build it. And then it was the patent was given to the Michael J. Fox Parkinson's Foundation happening in a week so so that's the original um, source of cosmolocalism is is that but uh, we want to use it in a much richer sense which is which is there's a lot of talk about the appropriate level of power being at the locality or the community uh there's also i would say i i have an anxiety many people would have an anxiety that that means parochialism or not in my backyard or the future stops here and, we'll, and it's a territory that is going to be fought, uh, fought over by a number of players. We think that people should be in there saying, you're here standing in Froome or Coatbridge, my hometown, or Torteridge, and just birthplace. You're also in the world. And you know that from your daily experience of, say, social media or your, or your, uh, your, your sense of the world's events that come through the news media. Let's extend that from just a social media awareness or a news awareness to a way of being in the world, a way of being on the planet. I mean, it's similar to Act Local, Think Global from the old um, Green Movement, um, but I think it's tied in with this sense that we have technology that will enable forms of local flourishing very, very tangibly in terms of food, energy, information, culture, you know, housing, whatever you, whatever you call it, uh, transportation, and that these infrastructures can be powerful and local what can measure themselves against the world and I th we, we think that's a, a an incredibly exciting vision for a kind of localist locally oriented Great. politics thank you so much thanks pat 
And um, we haven't got that much time, I'm afraid, for questions, uh, though I hope we've had a ch good chance to chat in the breakout rooms. I'm going to take a few um, that we've got gathered. And ideally, I would have liked people to speak their own questions. Um, but given the time, I might have to read them out. So this is a question from Phil Frodsham on the difficult, different experiences of working with local authorities. So Phil, are you there? And are you able to ask, ask this question? Yes. I am here, yeah. Which, which question is it? Because I've put a few in the chat. Well put, the question of your choice. Okay, it's probably the last one actually. I mean, we're 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 part of a I'm part of a small transition project in a small town, and 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 the whole talk has been absolutely fascinating. But it feels like it is out of our reach. It feels like, and and I know in our network in our, in our area, we're all very small towns, small projects, very few resources, really struggling to stay afloat how do we join this up how you know how can we be involved in this conversation so that we're not feeling that there's you know it almost feels like we need to be in a city or a large town to be involved in this and that's not the case for a lot of transitional community projects so how does this kind of work how can we get involved in this more can i invite peter or anaira you know first stage moving out from a small group of people Peter or Anaira? Can, I, can you just clarify by what you mean by this? How can we get involved in this? Just in kind of community building at a larger scale? I just want a bit of clarification. But, but particularly, I mean, I was particularly interested in what Pat was saying. I mean, we, we, you know, in our small realm, we were doing very well, but I'm interested in how we get involved in the larger media story. How do we get involved in larger media platforms? Because that seems to be something that, that we're really excluded from because of and be, because of the amount of resources that we've got. So it's that really, it's, it's really interesting hearing about these platforms. And then I think, but that's not for us though. I mean, I, I, I think that, I think you'd be amazed to think how much the tools were in your own hands on that, just in terms of content making. And part of our challenge is to, is to we used to call it a, a living manifesto, but part, part of the, Part of the thing we're trying to um, generate is resource and impetus behind the structures that could answer you on that, Phil. So, that, so you know, everybody with a smartphone can generate the content that they can. The question is how that becomes sucked into the bigger systems. We know how it appears on TikTok. We know how it appears on Twitter. We know how it appears da 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 da. There may be ways to use those systems, but we're actually genuinely wondering whether there's a completely different step for the structures that you're talking about that we are running around trying to encourage technologists and investors and philanthropists to invest in, you know, but I think you can do it now. And, uh, you know, you talk to us about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, second person I'd like to invite to ask a question. I've got quite a few questions in there. Roxy, would you like to ask your favorite question? Can't hear you though. Yes, sorry, just trying to think of what my favourite question is um, so much. Um, I guess really, yeah, it, it's the same sort of thing really. It's like, how do we pay people for, um, for this sort of content? It's all very well creating it or trying to create it. But, it, you know, if it's to be um, impactful and actually draw people in um, to doing things like, uh, you know, trust the people and be able to, create change in our communities how um yeah it's uh sorry it's been a long day <laughs> yeah like you know i can create content but i don't know if it's going to actually do any do anything um so and it'd be much better if i could pay someone else to do it and i know that that is gonna um draw people in to do great things um but you know small organizations just don't have those sorts of resources so um, how do we do it? I can answer. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it, it really is an, it's an ambitious question about the kind of systems that we try to build uh, of a different kind that do involve economic payment. You know, if, if you build a platform where the data that's generated doesn't just go into the 
Facebook servers, but comes back to that community and that community sees the patterns and reaps the benefit from those patterns. You know, we haven't even begun to think, well, some have begun, Dan Hind has, but to build those structures, you know, uh, we just uh, we, we maybe can do it in a voluntary open source kind of way, but I think I, we want to have discussions with major philanthropists and say you really need, and also good liberal capitalists, capital holders, you need to think about building a cooperative system that is economic, but just is doing it in a completely different way, and it's a completely different economic imperatives behind it. I mean, I think that's achievable. I mean, Wikipedia was achievable, right? So it's achievable, but we have to be ambitious about it. Thank you. And who's the we in that question? Discussion. I've got a question for um, Anaira or Peter. So how can, uh, yeah, what would it take to get rid of all the political parties in the UK? Nice small question. This yeah. is a question from Kathy. <laughs> oh, oh no, sorry, from Harriet Stewart-Jones. Sorry, Harriet. So, so I, I talked a little bit about this in my in the breakout group. That my sort of dream was that's what would happen. That it'll that it'll happen because we'll find that people have morals. But maybe I'm maybe this is where my naivety is extreme. But you know, my 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 dream or my vision was that we'd get um, functioning communities across the country at a community level, and that kind of makes the political system that we have that's so oppressive. Are redundant because because they, I mean they can continue to do the, the few big things that are necessary if you all the, the few um, national things that are necessary but actually all the action is at a local level and so so they simply become something that nobody cares about you know Boris is just shouting away there and nobody's listening that's my that's my dream it doesn't really answer your question but <laughs> I think once we have uh, kind of deliberative democratic processes like people's assemblies being really widespread and people using them then they'll be like well like this system that we have isn't a democracy um and actually we can build something better so i think that and obviously that will be on a like local scale as well so but then you can federate them like in rojava um in kurdistan they have federated people's assemblies and so the the seat of power is the community um, and yeah, once you just have them, I mean, I remember when I first did a people's assembly, which was like two years ago, and it just blew my mind. I was like, how is this, no, how have I never done this before? How did I never do this in school? And, and um, yeah, and then I was like, I want to get involved in helping spread them a bit. So I just think that once they start spreading, I think it will be like a domino effect. And then we'll be like, actually, this system isn't a democracy. Let's build one. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it can happen. Um, I think we need to do some of the groundwork first, but people want change. People are thirsty for change. Like no one's happy with the system that we have where kind of like it's about buying and consuming and, and just kind of, um, yeah, not being able to connect with people. I think we want change. So I think, I think they could disappear um, or they'll have to adapt. And if they adapt and they're more inclusive and they're using these participatory methods, then great, then we can keep them. That's great, thank you very much. And I know we've got to bring this to an end now. Um, and we've heard from Pat and from Peter and Anaira. Alana, would you like to say a final word as we're leaving? Um, very, very briefly, like I'm, I'm just noticed, like I've heard that there's been talk about jargon in the chats and the frustration around resources. And I just wanna say that some things, that some things grow slowly grow organically and that there is there is an importance in valuing the slowness of of some of the, the ways that our movement grows that um it's very easy for us to want to reach and go for it and change but actually what is like happening on the organic day-to-day -day level that um like where do we actually need to be and how do we balance that like desire for growth and change with actually the reality of our well-being, our capacity, our resilience, our resources, and just that feels really relevant for this conversation. And I think that starts, that comes back to the eye of like, where can I give? What what can I give? What where where's my role in this? Um, That's brilliant. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for taking part in this conversation. Thank you to the Transition Summit team. It's incredible, uh, you know, bringing together of people. And if nothing else, you've heard today about how 
you can uh, go to find out more about your own agency, how you can connect that agency to local communities, how those communities can take over local councils and how that is a much bigger story about us that is to be found in the, the alternative media. I hope that you'll get in at one level of this and join us uh, as we're looking forward to a, to a better future by us all taking action. Thank you very much for joining us and see you very soon. Thank you, Indra. That's been an amazing session. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the contributors, Alana, Anira, Peter, Pat. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.